And here we are, guys, almost at the end of this great journey together. Welcome back to the Pilot Factored. Um, so on this episode, we're reaching the peak. Um, we're truly going to see the culmination of everything that we've been talking about. Um, nutrition and sleep and fitness and cognition and how everything comes together to help us reach the peak performance, our biggest potential. Let's dive in together. All right, so how do we define peak performance? Um, because we've talked about it, we have, you know, kind of described it, but how do we define it for ourselves right now? Well, one one definition that I like is uh, a performance at the best level of a person's physical and cognitive abilities. What that means is that we have to take in all the physical aspects of things as well as our cognitive, our brain functions. Peak performance is a state of exceptional functioning. That's more rounded, I think. So the past to peak performance, as we've seen before, sorry, start with uh, sleep. And as we go up to the peak, we'll uh, have to work on nutrition, then uh, conquer fitness, and then cognition. Cognition is really our brain power. Um, so as we said, healthy body first, sleep, nutrition, fitness, physical performance is maintenance and prevention, really. Um, it's all the things that we do to keep the engine going, right? But then the healthy mind um, is the top, the peak cognition, peak potential. Once the physical performance has been achieved, our brain is now ready to do its part in supercharging that performance. Um, I think that a concept that applies well to performance is flow. Okay, flow is a stepping stone to peak performance. It's called being in the zone. It's a contact. Uh, it's it's a something also known as um, super fluidity. Uh, so peak performance versus flow. To understand the difference is you can experience flow while not at peak performance. Uh, peak performance is super flow, super fluidity. It's a more refined form of flow. Flow can be achieved on a daily basis, for example, through practice and repetition. It's something that we can actually do, that we can get in um, on purpose. Whereas peak performance is sort of a pinhole target that can only be achievable once in a state of flow. So see it as like your, your, your sort of a doable target every time flow is something that we can train ourselves to achieve whereas peak performance will be the the very end state of flow the super flow um flow is a state of intense concentration hyper focus and total absorption in the task okay you've probably said about yourself or heard itself before oh i was I was totally in the flow. I was in the zone. You know, that's what it means to be in that place where nothing else exists than what you're doing at the moment. It's sort of a paradox where time stands still um, and yet you lose track of it. It's there. It, it feels like it stops moving. But at the same time, like time doesn't exist anymore. The challenge is demanding in flow. But the task is effortless, effortless, sorry. Um, so you see like there's a, there's a paradox there where there's a balance of things where there cannot be flow without a challenging task. But once you're in there, it feels like that challenging task doesn't require any effort all of a sudden. It's a place where your mind is relaxed despite the intensity of the moment. Okay, you're feeling oh, you're feeling good. You're feeling relaxed and and stress free in that place, despite the fact that the moment is very intense and demanding. You feel deeply present, and yet you lose your sense of self. It's like you become part of the process or the machine. 
When in the flow, the outcome does not matter, only the task at hand. This is when you know you're in the flow, is when it doesn't matter, you know, let's call it like a, a game. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you win the game or not. The game is is all encompassing. Um, you become just um, melded with the process. So we wonder why we often have our most creative ideas in the shower. I'm sure you've been there where you're in the middle of that nice warm shower, you're cleaning up and all of a sudden this brilliant idea just pops in your head or this very creative thought or the solution to your problem that you've had and you're wondering, how am I gonna save that idea now? Anyhow, um, one of the reasons why we this happens is that in the shower we're completely free of distractions. Um, we're free of worry there. Like typically we kind of forget about life in general and these things kind of go away and we're left free to think clearly on some other things. We're free of judgment typically and that's why we can sing to our heart's content. We're free of other mental demands. Uh, we're not pressured by much else in there and uh, we're very much in the moment. Flow itself requires the same mindset along with total concentration. It requires a freedom of distraction, worry, judgment, and other mental demands. And for us to be there completely immersed in the moment. So a few factors, in fact, five, uh, five factors that contribute to flow are as follow. The task needs to be intrinsically rewarding. You need to be enjoying it so much that it brings you a uh, reward just doing it, um, enjoying it to the point where reaching your goals and your targets make you uh, happy. Your clear goals um, have to be there and a sense of progress. So what that means is that as you go ahead and follow those goals, if you don't feel like you're reaching them, then there's no reward there. There's no reaching a goal and there's no sense of progress. So therefore the flow would be blocked. Um, there needs to be clear and immediate feedback. And honestly, in flying, this is pretty much there all the time, right? As you're flying, you feel the airplane through your hands, through your feet, through your, the butt of your seat. And all these things are there to kind of give you the feedback you need to see how things are going. The perceived challenge must match the skills. And that means um, if you feel like you're in over your head, you're going to be in a stressful place and not able to really concentrate on achieving high performance. Rather, you're just going to be afraid of what could possibly happen. And on the inverse, if it's too easy, you kind of got to be bored. There needs to be intense focus on the present task and not the outcome. So this sort of comes down from all these other things and it explains that it, it sort of demonstrates that we need to be focused on what we're doing and the outcome of it is not so much important as how we are pursuing performance in the task at hand and if we give it a hundred percent if we know that we're fully immersed in what we're doing right now the outcome will be the outcome but it's most likely going to be good as we're doing our best. All right, enough of that. Um, so flow, um, here's sort of a model of a better picture of what flow looks like. So to achieve flow, the challenge is, as we said, to match the perceived, uh, perceived uh, skill level to the challenge. So for example, if our challenge is too high versus our perceived skill level then we fall into more of an anxiety window we're not it's not a good stress anymore it's anxiety we're we're not in flow there we're scared and we don't think that we can actually stand up to the challenge whereas if the skill level is perceived to be way higher than the challenge level then we fall in boredom 
And again, we're out of flow at that point. We're not engaged in the activity anymore. So it is imperative that the individual believes that he or she has the skills to successfully meet the physical, technical, and mental challenges faced. Confidence is key. Otherwise, as we said, fear, anxiety will overtake. So, in the end, flow only happens where the challenge or the perceived challenge matches the perceived skill level. Alright, so when we speak of flow, it's important to understand that flow is a mastery orientation. It means we're going after the pursuit of doing what we do well just for the sake of that, for the sake of of performing, not to stroke our own ego, not to look for our own benefit, but for the benefit of simply getting better at what we do. Okay? And that's why here the ego the ego has to take the back seat because it has no place in flow and the pursuit of flow. Um, so the ability or the skill can be perceived as striving to achieve mastery or to demonstrate learning at a task. So the goal then becomes to do the best that we can do within the achievement situation, not to win or defeat an opponent, made up opponent. So focus the effort on mastering the task in the moment to achieve flow more consistently. So what that means here is, for example, let me take an example of a basketball player. This player is facing two choices. They can play and, and work simply to be the best, to do their best and to keep getting better at what they do. So as they're playing the game, they're focusing on their actions. They're focusing on their skills. They're focusing on their shots, on where they run, how they run, etc. Not on the people in front of them. Obviously, the people in front of them, the opponent, will be part of the challenge, will be part of how they master their skill. But the, the name of the game here for them isn't simply to score more points. It's to do it well, consistently well. So, how do we achieve flow, for example? It takes focus, practice, focus, practice, practice, practice. Why? Because practice brings clarity. And practice will bring us focus in what we do. As things unfold, we can act out in accordance without thinking or judging every move. And that's important here because we get stuck into a paralysis of or a negative feedback loop of thinking about everything we do and try to figure out what is going like what's going on part of being in flow is that we have to be in a place where everything becomes automatic we're just there and almost like observing ourselves doing things rather than thinking about what's going on so we can trust our ability enough to not have to spend time planning, but rather just watch things unfold. Um, in this place, as we said, the ego withdraws, simply making way for the process to happen. We're done trying to figure out, okay, is it going to be good? Is it going to be bad? How is it going to reflect on us? No, nothing of that matters anymore. We're in a place where we're making way for the process to happen. We're trusting our skills and our abilities to take us there. So the key to creating flow is to practice a skill to the point where it becomes so ingrained in your muscle memory that you don't have to think about what you're doing. Okay, So muscle memory and thinking are two different parts of your brain. Muscle memory comes from the cerebellum and the thinking is a prefrontal cortex. And there's a link between intelligence and muscle memory here. An over-engaged prefrontal cortex can block flow through paralysis by analysis, okay? This means that if you're thinking too much about it, there's no place for your skill to just take over and get you there. There needs to be a point at which you're done thinking and you're just 
letting skill take over. And then you'll be in the flow. Um, there's been a study that's shown that brain waves of athletes in the zone or the state of the flow operate similarly to the brain waves of those in meditation. It's pretty interesting. Uh, achieving flow through mindfulness can be achieved through some fairly simple steps. And now, these are things that will help you get in flow. For example, pausing, taking three deep, slow, conscious breaths. And this, like we said, you can put yourself in a flow almost on demand, on cue. This is how we practice it. This is, for example, giving our brain and our body cues that this is what we're now trying to achieve. Pause, take three deep, slow breath. Then let the mind be fully engaged in the breath for that time and nothing else. Then focus your attention in the present moment. Take awareness to your sense perceptions instead. Make slow, deliberate movements. Go about your activity with intense focus. But remain alert. Now, this is not the time to be like, mm, oh, and fall asleep. No, no, no. <laughs> We're remaining alert. Keep the mind fully attentive to what you're doing in that moment only. So reaching peak performance. Um, we've talked about the fact that we need skill and we need practice to get in the flow. And that in turn will help us achieve exceptional functioning, which is what we described peak performance as. Yeah. So to reach that peak, to reach that performance, yeah, we need skill. And skill comes from practice. But there's one element, a crucial element, that also needs to be added to this equation. And that is positive psychology. That means we need, yeah, the, the, the muscle memory and we need the practice and we need to be in the flow. But all these things can be achieved pretty much every any day that we try that we, that we get in the flow that we work into um, just concentrating on what we are doing on focusing on the task at hand but aside from that we need to have a positive psychology element a place where we're mentally uh, pushing ourselves and supporting ourselves in what we're doing so reaching Peak performance, cognitive performance, demands mental and physical acumen to accomplish the set goal, but also a deeply rooted motivation to achieve excellence. What that means is, yeah, we can have the skill and we can have the IQ or the mindset, but we really need like a motivation, an inside motivation to achieve that performance. So in order to reach peak performance, as we said, there is a psychological side to it. And as uh, this material has been studied over the course of time, they've realized that um, there are some consistent characteristics to peak performance that are psychological. Some of them included our feeling of complete control, confidence, relaxed mind, narrow focus of attention, but that doesn't mean tunnel vision, so be careful with that one. And no fear of failure, for example. Um, again, as research has been done on the subject, they've looked at athletes more specifically because they're the ones that are most often required to consistently perform at their best. Um, they're always front and center and we're watching them. And for them, they're sort of the easiest crowd because there's, there's quite a few of them. They're the easiest crowd to, to study. And they found that in athletes, there are four common elements of success um, to uh, achieving highest performance. It'll be daily use of internal imagery, quality training, clear daily goals, and systematic mental preparation for competition. Now here we see training and daily goals. Uh, we've talked about that, clear goals and training. Uh, we've rehashed it over in the flow part. Now we have to figure out what this internal imagery and mental preparation mean for us. So visualization, um, the human brain 
does not distinguish between real and imagined occurrences. Basically, your brain, when it sees an image, it takes it for granted. So whether it's something that it sees outside of it or whether it's something that you're visualizing internally, the brain will accept it as reality. So visualizing clear goals and achieving them in your mind's eye enables the pathway to peak performance. It means to your brain, it kind of opens up this pathway towards achieving your best. Uh, for example, SEALs team use visualization to prepare. And these guys always, always will sit down and take time to create that scenario in their mind, walk through it and see what it looks like to achieve their goals in their mind. So with mental rehearsal, they are taught to visualize themselves succeeding in their activities and going through the motions. Um, visualization itself is described as recording a videotape of a desired sequence or performance goal. Okay, so imagine you're sitting there and if you had the ability to film yourself doing it just right and then playing it over and over and over in your head, by associating it with a specific event or word, it's then easy to recall and act out the sequence, just as though you were putting the specific tape you recorded. So for us in aviation, for example, if we have specific drills that we need to know, engine fire, engine failure, smoke in a cockpit, these things are words that will trigger um, that tape to play. And then we can just play out the sequence that we've learned by heart without trouble. Um, but there's other things that can be associated to it too. So this not only frees up your mind to help with decision making, but it also automatically puts you in the flow where your skills and knowledge naturally come up to meet the challenge. There's no thinking, just rise up to the challenge, rise up to the level of skill that you need to achieve in the face of this situation. So we need to understand that there is a difference between, you know, cognitive skills and motivated skills. Um, or a cognitive visualization, motivated visualization, basically. So cognitive is based on specific skills and operating procedures. It's all mental. It's all, or it's all uh, just ingrained training, whereas motivated is more personal, like that motivation comes from within. It's not from your skill. It's not from your knowledge. It's more goal oriented and it's more like self-management confidence. One thing that we often fail to do is to visualize failure. And why I say this is because while we train for uh, specific goals, which is good, but also we have to practice for when things go wrong. We have to plan for this. Chris Hadfield, <laughs> um, whom I love, say we practice over 10,000 different things going wrong as astronauts. What is the most likely thing that can go wrong and am I ready to face it and how do I know that I'm ready let's practice that thing going wrong and see if we can deal with it and that means by visualizing failure or by you know uh, planning or hoping for the best but planning for the worst type thing it allows us to prepare um, and to know the skills to know the drills to know uh, the things that will help us act out and perform to the best that we can. So over the course of the last few slides, we talked a lot about skill versus um, mental preparation. So let's dive a little bit more into what skill truly is and what it means in this whole equation. So for us, skill is an ability and capacity acquired through deliberate systematic and sustained effort to smoothly and adaptively carry out complex activities or job. Skills are the foundation to achieving peak performance and are mastered through training. Now, as pilots, we're most familiar with simulation devices from the static 
flight training devices, FTDs, to the full motion simulators, or even simple computer-based softwares. The simulation is closely associated with su uh, successful skill integration, no matter what you're preparing for. Through simulation, the brain is prepared to anticipate and match any challenges the training scenario presents. What does that mean for us is that as we anticipate different scenarios in our line of work, we have to prepare for them through skill training. And the way that we prepare, the way that we train, the way that we create and hone these skills need to be absolutely deliberate and systematic in order for those skills to come up and match the challenge of the job. The U.S. Army has a saying that you will not rise to the occasion, but you will sink to the lowest level of your training. Training uses the act of repetition to deliberately create neural pathways, programming your way to act and react a certain way. Those pathways, once you've created them, um, will be harder to change. And so don't expect a C-grade level training to bring you up to an A-grade level response when um, the rubber meets the road you'll just fall back to C-grade level training every time. So train like you fight, the U.S. Army says. I say train like you fly um, and fly like you train. And if the two match, you'll be consistently achieving performance, both in training and in real life. So there's the link here between our uh, goal setting and the challenges that we face and even goals and the briefings that we'll have that we'll face so use goal setting as a foundation to success and pursuing peak performance we say that athletes do that all the time the best athletes have a clear daily goal and remain focused throughout the day um, in accomplishing those so that means, you know, you have a timetable, you have specific targets that you want to reach, whether it's distance or time, or even in how they uh, the physically are, like their body weight and such things. They have clear goals established so that they can work towards them. When you're setting goals for your performance, they also have to be specific and challenging that's how they are going to yield the highest performance levels. Challenging goals elicit a positive stress response, and we talked about in flow, and an increase in performance, while easy goals are likely to result in a lack of effort because you'll be bored. And finally, we talked about visualizing. So briefing involves visualizing and verbalizing your pathway to success. As pilots, before we take off, we have what we call a takeoff briefing. Before we land, we have a landing briefing, an approach briefing. And these things, these times are set aside for us to be able to talk our way through each step of the process, to visualize it, to prepare for the things that should go right, and to uh, anticipate and brief for what we're going to do if things go wrong. A good briefing will establish common goals so that as a team, we can work towards achieving set performance targets. So that briefing is meant to be done as a crew, as a team, so that we create a shared vision of what performance will look like. Finally, um, we have mental preparation. Mental readiness is necessary when it comes to cognitive performance. Um, it's the ability of a person to create a balanced psychological state in which they can perform at optimal level. What that means is, um, for example, a typical gym session um, starts with stretching. 
and the objective being to prepare the muscles for the work ahead. So without a good warm up, jumping straight into an intensive workout can leave the body like hurting, you know, like you, you, you're you aching after that, you can't move as well as you used to, and you're going to recover poorly from that tra uh, workout. Altogether, not having gained much from all the stress that you put on your muscles. Um, Abraham Lincoln has been known to say, give me six hours to chop down a tree and I will spend the first four sharpening my axe. The same goes for any other skill intensive activities. If we prepare our muscles for an intensive workout, why would we prepare our brain for an intensive stress and high demand? So mental readiness includes um, this sort of preparation where we have to be in a place that is balanced, that is poised uh psychologically so that we can perform that means we have a focused mental state which deliberately sheds distraction and asserts control over anxiety and emotions in order to bring full attention to the current task and so sometimes we don't have you know the the luxury of doing that before we go into an emergency situation your engine cash is on fire and you have to deal with it. You have to take control of that anxiety, those emotions. You have to mentally and del deliberately focus on what you're doing. Bring your full attention to the task and have this balanced place where your mind is now active, engaged, and not distracted. Um, there are physiological factors or effects that we can look for when these things happen. Um, you can notice, for example, the increased heart rate, your muscular tension, uh, you become nervous. Use these cues, these changes as sort of flags to tell yourself, whoops, um, and don't let yourself you know, slide down that way and apply your coping techniques at that point. Labeling responses as positive stressors um, will help us out a lot. We need to use visualization and develop productive thoughts. The last, I would say the last step to this whole positive psychology thing that we've been talking about, because remember we said, well, to achieve peak performance, we can have flow. Flow stems from skill. And uh, we can enter flow every day, but entering positive or, or peak performance requires more than just flow. It requires a place where we're psychologically um, capable of doing so. And that takes a lot of mental acuity, a lot of, of practice. And this is called um, self-efficacy. So self-confidence in a more simple term is defined as the belief that one has in one's capabilities so that means you believe in your own capabilities to engage successfully in a course of action sufficient to satisfy the situational demand so self-confidence means i know i have the skill to face the situation at hand and this will influence performance through cognition and emotions we said stress is perceived and the ability to understand that we're up to the task dramatically reduces the amount of stress and the pressure this will have on our emotional state um so self-confidence or self-efficacy is what we call positive psychology it's the last most important step in creating the performance mind frame Self-efficacy is the more the past su uh, successes, the more challenging the goals we set, all right? So it's like watching a, a, a kid ride a bike. I remember watching my daughter learning to ride a bike, and, you know, she was so unsure, so kind of out of balance and wobbling all over the place. And it took a few times, but eventually she could ride a bike with enough confidence that she can go to her friend's house, or she can ride around the block without me being there to hold her up, to continually encourage her or tell her it's okay, it's going to be all right. And now 
not only is she riding her bike with no problem, she's asking me to go and ride down dirt bike paths. She wants to do jumps and stuff like that. So she knows, having seen her past successes, that she can now set more challenging goals ahead. This is a way that individuals perceive their level of skill and ability to perform the task or challenge will also influence their response to the other environmental factors. So as challenges arise, your mind looks around and says, yeah, I can do this. You know, I, I've dealt with like 98% of this before. So this new 2% that's there, it's all right. I got this. Positive talk, on the other hand, is choosing the words that your brain speaks to manipulate perception. It's estimated that the human brain can speak 300 to 1,000 words a minute to itself. Those words need to be focused, harnessed, and positive. No level of obstacle can prevail in crippling a mind that's continuously fed with positive self-talk. And that is true. Honestly, I teach that to my kids all the time. Use your words for good. If you're going to say something, say something positive. If you're going to think something, think something good. And you won't have a choice but to follow up with that. So as we look for peak performance, we have to find a way to understand it and tag it so that we know what it looks like and how to get back to it. Keeping our minds open and watching for moments of flow and super fluidity. We have to tag it to put a label on it and be able to understand it for ourselves. The pursuit of peak performance is a total commitment to excellence, but it cannot happen if we're not invested in it to a deep personal level. Because of this, seeking high performance without first truly loving what we do will be almost impossible. Um, the psychologist who looked into that in 1975 and wrote the, the, the first paper about flow posited that the original definition of flow as an state of consciousness um, that has a purpose in and not apart from itself it is the state the state itself is that is a is a purpose when people are engaged in an activity they enjoy and when they're functioning at their fullest capacity is when we'll reach a state of flow it'll look different for everyone It'll feel different for everyone, so we have to make it our own. Flow and peak performance can become tangible goals that we seek to experience every day. The pursuit of peak performance is a total commitment to excellence, as we've just seen. We need to be in it for that. It cannot just be, hey, you know, let's do a little bit of it, or, well, I wish I was, no. You need to be fully committed to what you're trying to achieve. Excellence can only truly be achieved when people are engaged in an activity they enjoy and when they are functioning as their fullest capacity, as we just said. Um, so I'm sorry to say, but if you hate your job, you're never going to achieve performance. You could be good at it, but you're never going to reach the peak of it. You're never going to achieve flow because it takes a level of enjoyment that allows you to sort of connect on a very personal level to what you're doing. So guys, as always, thank you so, so much for stopping by. I know this was a big chapter, but it's truly the stepping stone and the last building block into our review and our understanding of what peak performance looks like and how we can achieve it in our everyday work. So I hope this has helped you. I hope that you found some good in it. And as always, leave your comments, your questions below, and I'll leave a couple of questions for you also in the description of this video. But I thank you for stopping by and I wish you the very best in this day and in whatever you're doing remember enjoy your work give yourself the chance to grow to become better and to seek to make the world around you even a better place with the skills 
and the gifts that you have been given. See you next time.